This is Elizabeth DeHart and Ray DeHart. Show them some love. Good morning, everybody. Um, on this day that we um, celebrate the communion, uh, one of the things the Lord has put on my heart, as he, as he tells us as instructions when we go to uh, do this, we remember what he did it for. Hebrews 10 gives us um, a very powerful example of what he did for us. So if you uh, mind me reading here, I'm going to read just the first, well, up to um, verse 18. Um, let me first open up here. Father, thank you. Thank you, Father, for what you've done for us. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us enough to come down here to pay a price we couldn't pay. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy, your grace, for being that one sacrifice, uh, the one sacrifice for all to take away all other sacrifices. So, Father, have mercy on us. Forgive us our debts, Father, uh, as we seek your mercy and grace today. In Jesus' name. So in Hebrews 10, verse 1, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never be these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. In other words, what they did in the Old Testament um, with all the sacrifices every year didn't take away the sins. It only covered them for a, be, uh, for a time being. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, for the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sin. In other words, our sins are washed away in Christ. But they didn't have theirs washed away. It was just covered, so they had to repeat it and keep going back over through it. But those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. So Jesus coming down in the flesh. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them. So God wasn't, he wasn't necessarily taking pleasure in sin uh, covering. He wanted to make sure it was finalized. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second, which is our new covenant under Jesus. By that, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Back in the Old Testament. But this man, that would be Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by the offering, by one offering, excuse me, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That's all of us, folks. Hallelujah. Amen to that. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them, that after those days the Lord will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. That's his choice. He chooses not to remember what we've done. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. So that's one of the things that we have um, looking to look forward to. Um, also, Luke gives us, before I get too sidetracked here on myself, i got to make sure, there are too many notes, but I'm trying to shorten them, so bear with me here. Uh, in Luke 22... 
I'm using my phone because I'm still not, I just had surgery on my arm Friday, relieving, cutting all the adhesions off that I had received, so bear with me, folks. Um, 14 through 23. We're given some instructions here. Uh, when the hour had come, Jesus, or he had sat down with the 12 apostles with him, and he said to them, with fervent desire, I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks, broken and gave to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after the supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayers that uh, is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goes as has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they begin questioning among themselves that who would be to, to do the same. So Jesus is already telling everybody, okay, look, we've got, uh, I've got a deceiver here, somebody who's um, going to betray me, and... Um, He's not, uh, he's not mincing words. He's just trying to get everybody to understand that what is getting ready to happen. Now, of course, they were all blinded to it um, until after everything, until after he rose again. Then their eyes were open to all the stuff that he did. So going into, my wife's going to read for you right quick, um, and then I'll go into the scripture, and then we'll break bread afterwards. I'm supposed to read this one first. Anyway, um, why do we do communion? Um, what is communion? Communion is giving thanks and praise to God for His Son by breaking bread in thanksgiving and sharing a cup as we bless God's name. Communion always points us back to Christ. When we belong to Jesus, we are united with all other believers around the world in a special way as we break the, break the bread at communion. Let a person examine himself, then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. When Paul wrote this, he was addressing the disagreements that come up in the Corinthian church. He didn't want people sharing the Lord's Supper with anger in their hearts toward its other. God calls us to come to communion with a heart that is repentant and desires to be right with God and all the people in our lives. Does this mean we need to be a perfect person to go to communion? No, in fact, communion reminds us of the forgiveness we experience. But Paul urges us to examine ourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup so that we go into communion with a humble heart and not just pretending to be right with God. What's the purpose? A symbolic reminder of Christ's death. Okay. All right, so in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 23, Paul starts to give us the instructions here. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that which the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me so father thank you again uh, for sending Jesus thank you Jesus for what you did for us we take this bread now in remembrance of what you did for us. In Jesus' name. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will proclaim proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So, Father, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for pouring out your blood for us. 
We receive this blood. We receive this juice today, Father, in remembrance of what you did on the cross for us, coming down out of glory to pay for our sins. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank <clears> you. <throat>